This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 144 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have some heroes. Heroes in both ponies and senior nutrition. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month. I have my producer, Jen, with me today. How are you, Jen? I'm doing great. How are you, Debbie? Good, good. I'm excited for you. You are heading out the door here shortly to go to Kentucky. Yes, as we record this episode, we do these things well in advance because Debbie's organized Mm -hmm. that way. Uh-huh. We, we are fixing to head up north. We are in, in Ocala, Florida, which is where Horse Radio Network headquarters are. And we are heading up to Lexington, Kentucky for the retired racehorse thoroughbred makeover. So exciting. Yes, very excited about that. Lots of folks that we have gotten to know over the years through the various shows on the Horse Radio Network will be there either uh, shopping because you can buy thoroughbreds while you're there or yeah. competing okay. or going to take advantage of the entertaining and educational content that's going on up there. So I'm really excited to, to get going nice. on the road. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, I'm glad we could sneak this one in and get this recorded before you get out the door. We had some fun making these. We made them in two different days. So it's kind of fun. The The movie is really something everybody should see. I'm really loving what they did with this movie. It's just such a great message. And to get those equestrian movies out there, I have a bit of like long-term announcement. Long term, this is like 2021. Oh, but wow. Yeah, because involved in Julia Martin's movie that we'll be talking about here in a second, A Pony and His Boy, is Lisa Dearson. And Lisa Dearson has done the Equus Film Festival in New York City, and they, they've taken it on the run before. But she gave a film called Lomitas a big award, and a guy by the name of Florian Figge made it, and he's in Germany course Lomitas was a German bred horse that dad had trained and and basically saved by getting it to go back into the starting gate and Lomitas became I mean I I I could do a whole show on no no spoilers but Lomitas not only did your dad take on Lomitas and help him get through his issues that prevented him being an acceptable racehorse, despite the fact that he was very talented. But if I remember right, he inspired some techniques and some training tools that continue to help horses to this day. Do they not? You talking about the blanket? Well, I wasn't going to spoil it for anybody. Oh. Well, they don't know what it is. They have Spoiler to, they have to alert. listen to the show. <laughs> They have to listen to know what the heck the blanket when is. is. When is, is a- the Lomitas movie going to be available for us to? Uh, the Florian Figgy, you can go see. It was actually made for Dad's 80th birthday, just as an in-house kind of thing. And then I guess it, on a whim, they they actually offered it up to the Equus Film Festival in New York City, and uh, and it ended up winning something. But it was really intended as a birthday present for for mm-hmm. the family, and they brought Dad over there. But the cool thing is, a producer has picked up the story. That's a big producer in Germany, and you know, like um, what do you call it when it's the big themed you know movies a Full, robert a feature film a feature film that's the that's oh the so they're gonna of. take so they're gonna take the little one that they did as a gift for your father and they're gonna make it into a proper feature film exactly <gasps> i mean i don't <gasps> know the so story exciting. will be you know i know it is it's really it's really big news for us anyway because i mean his story is so incredible and the grandfather Walter jacobs who hired dad at the time really took a leap of faith you know hiring this this cowboy from California and, and, and he just, his progeny is, is amazing too. And that's, I think that's as much a part of the story for us as it is the Lomita story, which is incredible as it is back in the, in the nineties, you know, mm-hmm. and that's when the thing, anyway, so that's our theme here. We got a little video, um, I, I mean, a movie that was, uh, done well for ponies and horses and, and I won't spoil it for you cause you'll get to hear the interview in just a second. So exciting. Well, that is great. And we're going to get to A Pony and His Boy, the story of Barry and Josh, right after we hear from Omega Fields. At Flag is Up Farms, we've used Omega Fields Horseshine for years, and we love the results. 
and we're not the only ones. Lena Fittiment has this to say about her experience with Omega Horseshine. I was first introduced to Horseshine about 10 years ago by another rider at my barn who used it for her horses and loved it too. Her horses were in such good condition, coat, feet, mane, tail, I decided I had to have a try. I started my horse on it and haven't looked back since. Horseshine is such a great all-around supplement and helps with more than just shine, although it makes the horses so shiny. It's so palatable, and I find the horses eat it readily, and they lick their bowls clean. I've always kept my horses on it since I was first introduced. They always look so good, and I always have people comment on how shiny they are. We'll always be happy members of the Horse Shine family. Julia Martin joins us today to share about the making of the movie A Pony and His Boy, the story of Barry and Josh. The movie shows the power of a pony and the effect that he has had on Josh, an eight-year-old with Down syndrome. Josh had always been afraid of horses until he met this 28-year-old pony named Barry. The director of this is Julianne Neal. The writers are Lisa Dearson and Julianne Neal. And the stars are Mario Contreras and Joshua Martin himself. Well, welcome, Julie Martin. You're a mom, you're a horse gal, and you happen to be the mom of a perfect Down syndrome child named Josh. And um, I'm happy to have you on the show. How are you? Yes, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm excited to talk to you a little. Yeah, yes, I, super I, excited to be I, yeah, yeah. interviewing with you today regarding Joshua and Barry, his pony. I am sure you've told this story a few times in the last year, and 2019 has been a whirlwind year. You happen to be the roadie for Josh, and <laughs> taking him yes. on the road, right? On the road with uh, going to things like the Aquas uh, film, film Festival must have been amazing. And you and Lisa Dearson have quite a story to tell about this journey that you've been on with uh, Josh, but give us kind of an overarching about this film. How did this come about? So the film started, it actually wasn't predicted, of course. Mm -hmm. Joshua has his entire life been afraid of animals. And even though we had two dogs at the time um, that he was born, he was still very afraid of any animal. We'd go to friends' houses and we'd pull up and he would just tremble in the car and not want to go in if he thought anybody had a dog. And it kind of took me away from the horse world for for a few years. I would just go out to Lisa's farm, the Lusitano farm, and you know visit with the babies and help her here and there break horses, of course, without Joshua. Mm-hmm. And... I ended up moving basically a mile away from the farm. Mm. So I was there and I had also quit my job that I had of 12 years because of Joshua when he was four years old. Mm -hmm. So I was an at-home mom and super excited to be so close to the farm. So I started kind of, I don't want to say making Joshua come with me to the farm, (laughs) but he he had to come with me to Mm -hmm. the farm. Mm -hmm. And he would just kind of stay away from the barn. And Bill and Nancy, who also had lived at the farm, Bill kind of took him under his wing as like a grandfather figure. So Mm -hmm. he was always doing stuff around the farm with Bill. But he would just kind of play in the rocks and dig and, and do that kind of stuff that he loves to do. And slowly, I would coax him towards the horses, you know, each time we went there and he wasn't having it at all. No. <laughs> so, no, no, not at all. Your plan wasn't um, working. So, no, it was not working at all. So, you know, within, I don't know, probably five, six months of this, I was also, you know, riding daily for the most part with, with Lisa. And I ended up purchasing my horse from, from Royal from Lusitano. And I had her as well. So she was very much a part of our life at that time Mm -hmm. as well. And still wanted nothing to do with her. Didn't really want to go near the barns. He was starting to walk past the barns, but still would not go into the barn. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so I thought, well, let's maybe try also, you know, pushing it with Barry because Barry's so small and I level to him and he could just, you know, take a brush and maybe mm-hmm. brush him. So I would bring Barry out and he just would back up and be like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. So. And Barry is 28. Am I right? Barry. He, well, he's, Basically, by now he's oh. almost thirty. So because this go. was last summer, gotcha. yes, this was this was last summer, actually last May, yeah. So and, I assume he's quiet yes, and, and, oh. and safe and oh. all this. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, yes. And this pony, basically, they had him to help with the weanlings. You know, they would put the weanlings with him, oh, and yeah. he would kind of keep them in their place and and kind of teach them the way and be, be their babysitter. Perfect. So that's, that was his job. But with Joshua, he just was so gentle and so, you know, just wanting the attention from Joshua. Mm -hmm. Um, And Josh very slowly, you know, this, this was a year's time for him of trying to get him to even come near Barry, Mm -hmm. which slowly he started to. And then, we were walking out in the, in the field with the horses, they were grazing and we just happened to be walking out there and, and Joshua decided me ride Barry Mm -hmm. and Lisa and I look at each other and we're like, what? (laughs) And he goes, me ride Barry. And we're like, yeah. So we scooped him up and just plopped him on there. And it was history from there. I mean, it's interesting. It just, their relationship has just grown tremendously and we couldn't even get him off that day. So Is that right? I mean, it was, it was, yes. Oh my gosh. He was super excited about it and loved it. So, so then from then on every day we were over there with Barry, he had, he had a couple of friends that were there that would come as well and they would lead him around on Barry and, you know, so he'd see the other kids with Barry right. too. Yeah and really finally be interested in it. So, and then over time, he just started, you know, taking him on himself, giving him baths and mm-hmm. walking him and, you know, doing everything he possibly can. Doing and everything. Yeah. I, I think it's amazing that uh, I think a lot of people with any ch- kind of child, a, a small child, number one is small. <laughs> so yes. a fear of animals is not that big of a reach for children, um, especially big ones. But, you know, anything that's at eye level and above, you know, which is everything when they're when they're little, just about it can be fear inducing. Right. And so, you know, I think that your your story is relatable to a lot of people who have children who may not want to mix it up with with animals yet. What do you think the advantage of having animals in your life has been for Josh? For Josh, it's been a um, huge advantage, um, especially with Barry. One, because I'm relating to myself because I'm a I'm a huge animal lover, mm-hmm. so it helps it helps me too. <laughs> yeah. But for him, it, it with the pony, you know, with when you're born with Down syndrome, your muscle tone is really really low, and for him, his his core has gotten stronger. Mm-hmm his speech has, has gotten so much better since he's been riding Mm -hmm. Barry because he's building his core and teaching for him has been great because off the pony, I can't, I can't get him to want anything to do with learning, Mm -hmm. you know, numbers, ABCs, you know, Mm -hmm. talking with him. If he thinks he's learning, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it (laughs) when it comes to me. So when he's on the pony, I can work on his ABCs, we count, we sing, Uh um, and he's, he's engaged and he's, you know, doing it right along with me and super excited to do it. So it's been, it's been huge for him. Cognitive uh, responsibility, you know, he knows what he has to do. He cleans up, he helps me tack. He brushes Barry. You know, he knows exactly what to do with the pony. And fortunately, I'm now at a at a new new barn, and everybody there has just embraced Josh mm-hmm. because he is who he is, and he's very helpful, and he's always wanting to help others and their horses. And yeah. so now he's he's just a new kid. He's truly a new kid. 
it sounds like it builds a relationship between you and Josh as well, instead of the oh yeah, you know, taskmaster that you probably had to be for all the things that we are for children as far as learning goes. Now oh, you have absolutely. this common common love. Absolutely, it's it's absolutely wonderful. It really is, and we can share in it. Like you said, we share in it together. You know, even now he's riding my my large horse and. We even go trail riding and I pony him on Barry. You know, I'll I'll be riding my horse and I just kind of pull him along on Barry. So he's basically off on his own, you know, with Barry and doing just fabulous. Mm-hmm. You said that the horses yeah, in I, your barn, I, I saw in one of your interviews that all the sizes, they take care of Josh. Why do you think yes, they do sure. that? Why? How, I mean, what is it about them that are, indicate that they're taking care of Josh? Well, because horses are healers and I feel they look at him and they know, they just, they just know that he's special too. Mm -hmm. And they, they just bond, they look at each other and the horses come down to him, to his level for him to be able to pet them and Mm -hmm. engage with them. It's, it's just amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. It, It really is. It's horses are such a gift and with people po- don't, you know, mm-hmm. don't understand that or, you know, animals are a gift, but, you know, with the horses, it's because they are so large to see them submit to him. It's, mm-hmm. it's tear jerking actually, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. it's, you see that you see the connection. Connection is a great word. Yeah. Yeah. What's your horsey background that led you to encourage Josh to be with the horses like this? Um, Well, I grew up riding as a child and then I, I did, I did hunter and then I became an adult and was away from the horse world for about, oh, 20, almost 20 years Mm -hmm. about. And then, like I said, I, I was always, you know, involved with them, but I never went back to having my own because I worked full time and mm-hmm. I, I have two older boys as well. So I was going to ask you about them. that. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. So he has two older brothers and are they into horses? He, oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Why not? No. Why not? Uh, you know what? I tried. Um, oh, one likes, one actually likes horses and will, will be there and hang around um, with them. He would always, you know, take the horse and walk it for me and whatnot when he was little, but neither one of them really had an interest in, in riding. They're just, yeah, they're just yeah, boys. It's not unusual. Not it unusual. wasn't their thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but they weren't afraid, you know, or anything well, like that. It good. just wasn't their thing. Yeah. That is the, that's a common story, but you know, I'm so happy that you Hey, one out of three is not bad, especially since they're boys. <laughs> Getting well, them into the horses, yes, right? Especially because they're boys, and and with this journey with Josh, it just really um, has helped me as well because that is my out. Mm-hmm. My horse is my out. You know, she she relieves everything for me, mm-hmm. and yeah. it just. You know, it, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful thing for both of us. What builds it's more confidence? A true blessing to have. Oh, that's nice. It is a blessing. I, you know, and I'm glad. I'm glad you said that out loud too, because I was going to say it if you didn't. But what gives Josh more <laughs> confidence? Do you think, like the groundwork, everything that you have him doing, the cognitive, the cleaning, the you know, picking the hooves out, all those things. It kind of reminds me of Montessori with my kids too. You know, they they didn't get into horses either. They're uh, tennis players, but I I wanted them to have that at, at a very young age. Those tasks that you know, no matter if it's animal centric or not, that help them build confidence in their fine motor skills and all those things. Groundwork or riding. So I think groundwork for a relationship with a horse, uh, for yes, responsibility, yes. and then riding for balance for sure. and control. What what gives Josh more confidence though? The riding gives him more confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's balance. It's, I think, feeling free, you know, mm-hmm. the, the freedom of it. Um, because he he'll put his hands in the air and to the sides and mm-hmm. you know we we dance on there you know he just i think he just feels free on the pony when he's riding him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah that's i 
I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. <he's, laughs> right? That's your yeah, reward. Yeah, absolutely. How did Josh react absolutely. when he saw the film? Oh, gosh, he was super excited. He absolutely loved the, loves the film. He still loves the film. He still loves to watch it. Aww. And he actually, I think he loves everything that goes along with it. The the fame is, um, you know, he's a very people person, Aww. you know, so... But yeah, we went to, uh, we took the film to the Down Syndrome Congress um, convention. Yeah. And oh my gosh, he was a star. Oh, Briar funny. Fest, he was the star. Oh my gosh. Him and Mario waving at everybody. And on there, he was on Maximo and Joshua was on Barry. And mm. Mario was, you know, doing his dances on Maximo around Barry. And mm. they went into the, they were in the big arena and waving at everybody. And everybody was responding back. It was really fun. It was really, really what exciting for what him. What a great thing. So this is a film, the, 20, the one that we're talking about is a 23-minute documentary directed by Julianne Neal. And it won the... Winnie Award, the prestigious Winnie Award from the annual Equus Film Festival, of which Lisa Dearson is founder and inspiration. And it's yes. been selected and screened at the National Down Syndrome Convention in Pennsylvania, like you just mentioned. One thing I wanted to ask you about is what is a Spotlight Rescue Series film? Um, that Lisa could answer better for you. Oh, I'd spot- love to talk to Lisa about that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to speak with her now? Yeah. Do you want to put her on? Sure. Hold on. Thank you. Hi, Deb. How are you? Hi, Lisa. Great. Thank you Hi, for, for agreeing to, to jump on here. I, I thought it sounded important, this Spotlight Rescue series. It sort of begs the question of what else are you doing <laughs> to Spotlight Rescues? Well, with the Equus Film Festival, we get so many issues brought to us about th- things going on with horses. So Julianne Neal, who's one of our filmmakers partnered with us and we're, we've developed the spotlight rescue series, which focuses on the positive as well as the negative things that are happening with horses. So we have last year, we did a documentary on the Havasupe horses in mm-hmm. the grand Canyon that are so badly abused. And we had, we started the whole series with focusing on the hanging barn that happened in Meadville, Pennsylvania with the horses that they had, they had left suspended from the ceiling because their feet were growing and they just fed them handfuls of food to keep them alive. It was it was just a horrible story. It cir- cir- did it kind of this circulating around on Facebook and people want to know what happens to those horses after they're mm-hmm. after something get, they get rescued. So with Spotlight, we, we did a story about the sort of horses that survived that and where they are now and you know, to show the positive things that mm-hmm. rescue can do. So mm-hmm. that's what we do with Spotlight Rescue Series is focus on good and bad. And so the Barry and Josh story, it, watching it unfold and being able to, you know, have access to a filmmaker where I, where I could send footage to as this story unfolded and and watch the story happen and grow was really kind of cool. So. Yeah. That's, that's how, you know, a positive thing that the horses can do with the healing with Josh with Down syndrome. It's just amazing, amazing. to watch. Yeah. Thanks for being there and, and starting that all off in that field with little Pony Berry. I heard this is yeah. also going to be shown in Germany and Britain. Is that still on the schedule? Well, we what the biggest place it's going to be shown right now is we're going to Manipur, India wow. in November with the Equus Film Festival. So we'll be taking it to Manipur. It'll show at um, in Germany at the Equinal Film Festival, which is a horse film festival in Germany. And then um, we've got some of our filmmakers in uh, the UK are going to be screening it. And then it's screening it's screening around the country now, and it's going to go to the Can Praxis uh, event that'll be happening up in Canada in September. And it's a series of films that Equus is sending um, for a wounded warrior program, PTSD, and mm-hmm. all different kinds of ways that horses help with mental health. Fantastic! And I yeah. love I love that Barry is a you know co-star in this film, A Pony and His Boy, mm-hmm. and that he it shows that a horse could be old, maybe even sure. way over the hill. 
but that he mm-hmm. can still find a job and he can still be loved and be super useful in our in our communities. Well, right, right. And he had just been a discarded pony for to us. Someone gave him, you know, they didn't need him anymore. And he mm-hmm. just was kind of tossed to the side. So we used him with our, with our yearlings, but it, you know, just to, to know that, and he doesn't know he's 30 years old. He right. is trotting. He is fast. He did Briar Fest and just pranced his little self around Briar Fest like he was a 15 year old. No one knew he was 30. They were shocked when, oh, when we told them that. So, you know, it's really given him a whole new lease on life. Yeah. He just now has a purpose, and that's Josh is his purpose. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we'll wrap up with Julie if you don't mind. Okay, I'm going to hand it back. right back. Okay, there you thank go. You. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Julie. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to wrap up with um, the fact that I found out about you through my title sponsor, Omega Fields, because it's such a compelling story that they said this story must be told. And I'm so proud of them for sponsoring you all. And, um, it, uh, you know, the the thank yous that we get in our communities are few and far between, really, for keeping such a, it's an expensive hobby, these darn horses. It is a very expensive <laughs> hobby. <laughs> yes. That's and for sure. Any help is, is a big help in a lot of cases. How has it been helpful for you? Oh my gosh, it's been, as far as the Omega Fields goes, it's it's been absolutely wonderful. And to see, you know, Barry's been on it over a month now, oh, almost two months. And wow, I mean, he's just, his his coat is great. Um, his energy level is great. He's he's just, you know, Josh made him a new pony, but this is really making him a new pony. He's just acts so much younger than what he is. Yeah, sounds like he's he needs that to keep up with that that schedule, that media schedule you guys have to. Oh right, no, he does. And the, the supplements are are wonderful. They're That's absolutely great. wonderful. That's great. Well, thanks so much for telling us your story. We'd love to catch up with you occasionally and and see how the story is still unfolding and how Josh and Barry are great spokesmen for horses and healing and this connection that you spoke about. But I also want to hear from you as the mom who's, um, you know, in the somewhat in the background, you know, really leading this charge and the Lisa Darsons who are the... um, the introducers and the influencers in these things too. So if you don't mind, I will tap you when there's something new to tell us and the, our listeners will be wanting to hear. Yes, I would love that. I'd love to continue on. Yes. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Julie Martin, for being on Horsemanship Radio. Thank you, Debbie. And thank, thank you, Lisa. you. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Cavallo Horse and Rider, Carol and Greg Giles, too, have been longtime supporters of the Horsemanship Radio, and we thought, you know what better way to show how their support goes than through the people who buy their boots? So we have this from Brenna Eldridge on a Facebook post. I could not be happier with my decision to transition my horse to barefoot and choosing Cavallo for his hoof protection. I always thought my horse just had bad feet and that he would always be lame barefoot until I realized that I was enabling that dependency. By allowing his feet to adapt back to the way that they were naturally intended, his feet have become strong and he now seems perfectly comfortable barefoot. With the added weight of a rider on rough terrain, I invested in my first pair of Cavallo boots. I went with the Trek boots, and they fit him perfectly. I was able to do anything that I could do in metal shoes, and I have no longer stress over him losing a metal shoe and damaging his hoof when removed. The Cavallo boots have provided him greater shock absorbencies when riding on hard ground, and so far, whether it be on trails or in the arena, he seems extremely comfortable in his boots. I do a variety of riding, including trails, gaming, and drill, and I'm excited to get into the gaming season to put truly those boots to test. I believe that in horsemanship, you have to pick methods that make the most sense to you. And for me, that is the naturality of barefoot and the protection of the Cavallo boots. Brenna. Juliet Getty, PhD, is an independent equine nutritionist with a wide U.S. and international following. 
Her research-based approach optimizes equine health by aligning physiology and instincts with correct feeding and nutrition practices. Dr. Getty's goal is to empower the horse person with the knowledge to provide the best nutrition for his or her horse's needs. Dr. Getty is the author of the comprehensive resource, Feed Your Horse Like a Horse, as well as the seven topics centered Spotlight on Equine Nutrition series of booklets. She also offers an informative e-newsletter, Forage for Thought. Her website, GettyEquineNutrition.com, provides a world of useful information for the horse person. Well, welcome, Julia Getty. I'm, I'm glad for our sort of quarterly pop in and uh, give us all we need to go uh, for the next three or four months. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very well, Debbie. Yes, I really enjoy these visits. Wonderful to be here. Well, our listeners do too. We've learned a lot from you, but I know there's a lot to learn about our our friends, the horses. And um, I know that you and I, in between times, talk a little bit about what things are current, how people are thinking, what's the latest, greatest, what's maybe something people are overlooking. And a lot of my friends, you know, I'm, I'm the demographic of those women that uh, finally the kids are all grown and out of the house and we mm-hmm. can we can think about our horses full time again and that means sometimes our horses are a little old <laughs> too they're more yeah. mature I will along say like with that. us mature they, along they with at the us. same rate absolutely exactly because you know the old saying green on green makes black and blue so. oh <laughs> no I don't know that one but I like it yeah you can use that one I I borrowed okay. it from somebody else so. <laughs> But yeah, so sometimes we do, um, we've had our horses for a long time or, uh, we're keeping our horses as healthy as we can. We don't want any of those two and three year olds bouncing around under us anymore. And, um, so we want to take care of them. They're, they're our old friends. And I thought, well, I'm going to ask Juliet. I know that you've, you write a lot of articles. Let's start with that. And Mm -hmm. you do a lot of consulting. So you told me that you had recently written an article about the mature or aging horse. And Mm -hmm. I want to know more about that because of my demographic. Well, sure. This is an issue that any horse owner will face if you keep a horse long enough, because as horses age, They develop all kinds of um, health issues. This is something that we uh, experience as well, as as we all know. But I did write the article recently. It's called How to Help Your Aging Horse Live a Vibrant Life. Because horses really, just like people, um, age at different levels. Some age more gracefully than others. But horses typically live well into their late 20s. I have clients with horses into their 30s. I've even my the oldest horse I've worked with was actually 44 and that's unusual granted but he was happy and he just you know he was grazing and one day decided that he would die in his sleep which is you know which was uh, very very soothing for him and for his owners but Mm -hmm. as horses get older they do experience issues with their digestive ability which impacts their attritional status since if digestion isn't good then uh, nutrient absorption isn't as good and that can impact just about any place in the body Mm -hmm. Um, and then they have problems with their joints and their muscle mass and they're more prone toward uh, problems with their immune system with inflammation throughout the body um, their their bones can become porous, and basically they may just start to not feel very well. So I like to address all of those things and look at the whole horse when I work with a horse owner. That's a lot to take on. <laughs> it is. It is. You just listed a, a litany of uh, <laughs> of aging horses problems, but yeah, let's let's pick at it one at a time. First of all, you know, so if somebody who has that like. 15 to well let me ask this question are do different breeds age at different prog- progression do do some breeds do you see you know like big dogs and small dogs kind of thing and- I don't know that they age differently, but but different breeds are prone to more health problems, um, particularly insulin resistance and uh, metabolic syndrome affects some breeds more than others. So that can certainly impact how they feel and and can age them more quickly. But horses, I've seen horses look old at 15 and I've seen horses look young at 27. Uh, So it really depends a lot on how well they're taken care of, what life demands of them, how much stress they are enduring, because stress impacts 
the health of all the tissues in the body. So it, it's really hard to, to give an exact uh, answer. Okay. It really just depends. Okay. So then just to take a, a sort of middle of the target, somebody has a 15 to 17, 18-year-old horse. Now, I don't mm-hmm. consider that old. Sometimes no, I, I, don't I think either. they're almost in prime at that point. Absolutely. But, I yeah. do too. I think we're looking at older horses' symptoms more when they get into their 20s. Right. But what could they be doing at that stage of the game, knowing that this progression is inevitable? Assuming, assuming sure. That there's, you know, we don't dive of something else in between, but right. Yeah. Well, the, the, the most important thing is to control inflammation okay. because inflammation can damage the tissues such as the joints and the digestive tract, but it can also damage the brain and the brain is particularly responsible so, well, for, for everything actually, but uh, in terms of the horse's overall health, When the brain is inflamed, we see horses develop Cushing's disease, leptin resistance, which impacts their weight, uh, insulin resistance, which impacts their risk of uh, developing laminitis. So we want to control inflammation, and there's a, a few key ways to do that. The first is to reduce stress, and I've talked about this many times, but Uh, One of the most stressful things a horse can endure is not having forage available to eat all the time. So when a horse uh, is restricted from, from hay, the horse goes into survival mode. And that causes insulin to rise, which is a phenomenon to hold on to body fat to survive, for example, in a harsh winter. But insulin, when it's elevated, is inflammatory. Insulin is a highly inflammatory hormone. It can damage the feet and it can damage the brain. So we want to make sure that they don't have the stress of that. They want to be able to eat and feed like a horse and be allowed to graze. And then, of course, their lifestyle should should be uh, as low in stress as possible, you know, where, where they have access to, to buddies, or they have companionship, they have freedom to move. Mm-hmm to allow them to be the way they were intended to be intended as much as possible. Mm. So, so stress. And then the second thing is what nutrients or lack of are we, are we uh, subjecting them to? One of the most inflammatory feedstuffs that we give our horses is genetically modified soy. Mm. And mm. soy, soybean oil, soybean hull, soybean meal, the list is uh, long. Uh, soy products are typically found in most commercially fortified feeds. I say most because there, be, there are now more and more feeds coming out that are aware of this and are eliminating soy from their, from their recipes. But soy, when it's genetically modified, means that it can withstand being sprayed with Roundup, a herbicide. So the weeds get killed, but not the soy. And on the surface, that sounds like a really good thing. But the chemical found in Roundup called glyphosate is very damaging to the body on many levels. And I won't go into that specifically. But basically, suffice it to say that if we remove soy uh, from the diet, we will be removing a very significant inflammatory agent. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is a Getty campaign. Hashtag mm-hmm. no soy. That's, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's big. And for well, it to be uh, that pervasive... My goodness. It is because it's a really inexpensive way to feed. If most of the fat, for example, if you look at a feed bag, the list of ingredients, maybe it'll have 6% fat. Okay, so then where's that fat coming from? Most of the time, it's coming from something called vegetable oil. And vegetable oil is another way of saying soybean oil. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes it will say soybean oil. So that's not only um, inflammatory for the reasons I just mentioned, but soybean oil is also... Um, very high in uh, omega-6 fatty acids relative to omega-3s, and that causes an inflammatory condition as well. Too high levels of um, omega-6 fatty acids increases inflammation, whereas omega-3s do the opposite. They lower inflammation, and most horse diets are well or exceed the level of omega-6s that they should have to be healthy. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason to avoid uh, feeds that are high in soybean, in soybean so, oil. Yeah. So it, that's so you're telling us to get rid of this inflammation, we need to cut out something. So what could we put back? Like I think omega-3s is one of those things that you've told us before. Pe- people are yes. a little short on feeding. So would you put that in as an anti 
inflammatory process. Right, I would. I would instead of instead of feeding something with soy. So here, here's a let me let me let me back up just a second to make it more simple because I think people are thinking, oh my gosh, now what am I going to feed? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing left. So, oh. so look at your label, look at the ingredients carefully. If it's not what you want, then then you can either search for a feed that does not contain soy. Or you can go with a basic ingredient like a hay pellet, such as an organic alfalfa pellets or a Timothy pellet or some non-genetically modified beet pulp, those kinds of things. And then we can add to that a, a source of omega-3s and 6s in the right proportion. Ground flax seeds are a good thing to do. Uh, chia seeds are also good. Hemp seeds are, are excellent as well and products made from them. And so these are ways to get the right fatty acids into the horse's body without overloading them with too many omega-6s. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and I always say ground flax is so hard because it's unstable that I, I pushed for the omega fields. Their omega-3s are amazing. So a little Yes, you want a there. stabilized product. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and then some of the um, essential fatty acids, vitamin Cs, let's talk a little bit about that too so that we know we can do something to help the infl inflammation. Well, the essential fatty acids, there are two of them. One's an omega-6 and one's an omega-3. And if you evaluate how much is in fresh living pasture, for example, uh, during growing season, you'll find there's about four times more omega-3 than 6s. And the, common, the, the commonly found commercial feeds have it inverted. They'll usually have about three to four times more omega-6s than 3s. So there you, you can see that we have to fix that balance. So that's the first thing. And we do that by feeding those other fatty foods that I mentioned. You brought up vitamin C. Yeah. This one is a little controversial. Uh, vitamin C is um, produced in the horse's liver. We, uh, human beings, are not able to produce vitamin C. But horses can, and their livers do that. But as they get older, their livers just aren't, you know, as as um, functional yeah. as they were when they were younger. That's a normal sign of aging. And so vitamin C production sometimes declines. And I like to supplement vitamin C to an aging horse because of that. Vitamin C is involved in the formation of collagen. And collagen is a protein that's found in the bones, uh, in the joints, and, and throughout the body, really, in the blood vessels and so forth. So the only time I don't supplement vitamin C is if there's a horse that should avoid too much iron because vitamin C increases mm -hmm. iron absorption. So horses that are insulin resistant or have Cushing's PPID, I usually am very conservative with uh, supplementing vitamin C. So one of the things that I, I learned about muscle production, I hope I learned this correctly so you can correct me, but mm -hmm. is that muscle production and, you know, we, we lose muscle mass as we age, but muscle production actually pulls some of the calcium or some of the, the ingredients of the bone away to build up the muscle so that it's our obligation to put back in the calcium and the important parts of that bone structure so that we keep ourselves um, away from risk of fractures. Is that well, the sure. same, with, same with horses? Well, well, the, the muscle is mostly protein. Um, so when there's not enough protein quality of the, in the diet, in other words, when there's not a sufficient amino acid pool from protein sources, then the horse will actually um, break down its own muscle tissue to provide those amino acids. Mm. could also happen for glucose production, though that's just not as likely unless we have a situation with uh, metabolic diseases. Um, but the bones also are made of protein, and they too need a good quality source of, of uh, protein by mixing your protein sources. So not just hay and not just alfalfa, but also adding other things like the flax and the hemp seeds I talked about also provide more protein. Okay. But minerals like calcium and magnesium and phosphorus, these are very important for bone health. And here's another thing that, that many horses experience who uh, receive um, the gastrogard or omeprazole. When we, when we give this particular drug to help our horses to either prevent or treat ulcers, omeprazole inhibits the absorption of the minerals that are involved in bone formation. 
So over a period of time, the bones will become porous if the horse is on a meprazole for a while. So I don't like that drug. It also inhibits protein uh, digestion. Right. So that that inhibits the the horse's ability to digest the protein. So basically, it's it's not reaching his cells. The amino acids are not reaching his tissues. So that's a drug that we really want to be aware of. It's a dangerous drug. It should be used very sparingly. Okay. But most forages, just to get back to calcium, most forages are high in calcium. So we want to make sure that the horse is getting enough magnesium and enough vitamin D okay. also. Yeah. And that doesn't just come from the sun. Well, it does come from, well, that's where the horse makes vitamin D from is by being exposed to sunlight. Mm -hmm. But if the horse is inside a stall, right. <laughs> it's not going to exactly. get much exposure. Mm -hmm. Also, if the horse lives in the upper third of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, or into Canada, then the angle of the sun is such that they don't produce as much sunlight as they would say down here in Texas or in Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to consider adding vitamin D to the diet and all horses can benefit from it uh, during the winter time as well. So that's involved in proper bone formation as well as other aspects of the, of the horse's health. Yeah, good. So forage not only brings down stress, that's a, that's a help. It also adds calcium to their bones. So it's doing everything absolutely. right for them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And their psyche. And their psyche too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So, um, what I love about you is you're staying away from a lot of the nutraceuticals and you're, you're actually trying to get us to naturally feed and accommodate our horse for their lifestyle yes. to actually bring all these problems of, of aging into alignment so that we can reduce them and optimize their life. Wow. That was a mouthful. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was good. That that was well said. <laughs> Did I write um, that down? They, they, <laughs> I tend to like to. I, I tend to gravitate toward um, whole foods mm -hmm. and herbs where I can. Turmeric, for example, is a yeah. beautiful herb that's really um, very potent anti-inflammatory agent. How and would you feed it, that turmeric? Well, it, you know the the problem with it is that it doesn't taste very yeah, good. Yeah, and it's yeah. <laughs> And so um, there are several supplements on the market. I have a few in my store. There's there's plenty all over the place for horses that contain turmeric that you can try that are mixed with other things to increase the palatability. And so if your horse, most horses do tolerate it just well, just fine. My horses always did. Occasionally you'll get a picky eater that won't eat it. But that's that's one thing you can do. Colostrum is another one. Mm. I'm a big fan of colostrum and I invite my listeners to visit the library on my homepage, which is gettyequinenutrition.com. And I have an article in there on colostrum. It is such a fantastic superfood. It helps with the joints, with the immune system, with digestion. It heals leaky gut syndrome, which is a major problem mm -hmm. for horses. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that I like to add to the diet. That's fascinating. So how do you... Colostrum, you, you should define what the colostrum is in case somebody else... Sure. Yeah. yeah, well, most people... Think colostrum isn't that the first milk? You know, mm -hmm. when the when the foal is born, it is the the first few hours of uh, of uh, lactation is not really milk, but rather this milky substance which is um, called colostrum that contains a large amount of antibodies mm -hmm. that the that the newborn needs to get to protect his immune system. And I used to think that as as the horse got older, uh, he could no longer absorb those antibodies. But that turns out to not be true. Um, so by feeding a uh, colostrum, the antibodies that are in that actually do get absorbed to the bloodstream and protect the immune system in a variety of ways. So really worth feeding to any horse, not just older horses. It makes good <laughs> sense. But I've heard that colostrum is hard to stabilize. Well, you want to get something that is that is stabilized, that's um, not overly heat treated. You don't want to, you know, pasteurize it really at any high heat because that destroys the antibodies. But it has to be be quickly frozen. And uh, I'm not really up on the exact procedure, but I work with a particular company that that has a very fine way of handling it, and it's tested to be active. Oh, fascinating. Okay, is there information on your site about that too? <laughs> 
Yes, on my store, I have Kalash uh, there. So rather than give a name of a particular company, sure. I just invite people to visit that. That's, that's right, because it might change. You never know. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. This, these podcasts last forever. So go go study um, 150-year-old <laughs> Dr. Getty's site. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's there forever. <laughs> so one of the things that I, I know that you're big on is holistic health for the elderly and the young, I mean, all horses, you people beat a path to your door to find out how to feed, how to maintain, how to keep their horse healthy. Do you, do you treat the person too a little bit? Do you actually talk to people about the keeping them healthy? Like even, this is a touchy subject, weight yeah. on the back of the horse, <laughs> you oh, know, stay. Well, I talk about the person's weight, not all. Well, that's, not something. <laughs> that's a bit blunt, <laughs> but <laughs> but but is it is it a kind of thing where you you know you want the whole relationship to be healthy and that people need to stay in shape to be on top of their horse and everything else does that ever work well, against um, you? I think it, it has come up maybe one time that I can recall um, if a person volunteers that information like if a, if the if the horse is developing pain in, in its spine or if it's being ridden too or too at too young an age yeah. those types of things I'll bring up but I do work with the horse owner in conjunction with the horse because it's the horse owner's responsibility to 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 feed the horse correctly. And I approach it, the word holistic, from my perspective, means the whole horse, including his body, his mind, and his environment. Yes. And so I look at everything that that horse experiences, not just from a dietary perspective, but his lifestyle, his companionship, his ability to, to exercise, and so on. And so that that goes along with what the owner is capable of doing because some owners have horses in their backyard, some horses are stalled, some um, are exercised regularly, some are not. It just, the age of the horse owner may influence, you know, if a horse owner has arthritis really badly and cannot ride anymore, that influences the health of the horse as well. So yeah. there's just those kinds of things that I integrate. That's Absolutely. Nice. That's great. That's what I love about you, Dr. Getty, is that you really do take each individual horse and human uh, to their to their environment. And I think that's what we're all looking for because everybody says, well, that's fine for their horse, but what do I do? And I, I think that is such a personal thing. And depending even on where you live and what you have available to you, you and I have talked about that too, about stabling mm -hmm. or, or feeding in a small area, even if they do have pasture, how do you keep them mobile and all those things, which I love, I love holistically about that. I mean, that's this part of our mission statement is to integrate horses in people's lives. We think that's so valuable. We have a youth at risk program. We have veterans ah. with yeah post-traumatic stress program yes. and mm -hmm. horses are so useful in those. And, and the People participating don't even know that usually coming in. They've not even been around horses and they leave, you know, wanting to be a trainer. It's lovely. <laughs> it is lovely. Absolutely. And horses are very uh, sensitive animals and they can, they can sense what our needs are and, and how we are, we come across and what we're feeling. So all the more reason that we need to respect the horse's needs, because if we want them to be helpful to us, then we have to first make them healthy and sound so that they have the energy that it takes to be helpful. Yeah, meet their needs. Uh, yeah. Before I leave you too, but I wanted to see if you'd even want to touch this subject, but what mm -hmm. is your feeling right now about the, the thoroughbred industry and the things that are going on at Santa Anita and the way we are feeding and housing and and treating our um, thoroughbreds in that environment? And remember that my past comes from a a background of training thoroughbreds. So, yes, you know, I am, I am just sitting on the fence waiting for somebody intelligent to step up and say, here's, here's a, a path we can pursue. Well, the whole, the whole situation in Santa Anita is really tragic and I'm not really sure that there's an answer yet to what's causing the problem, but the racehorse industry in general does tend to utilize the horse, in my opinion, more like a machine than a living creature. And I feel that we need to pay closer attention to the digestive tract of these horses and the age at which, at which we exercise them intensely because they come off the track really quite broken. 
They have all types of osteopathic disorders, and they generally have severe ulcerations throughout their digestive tract. And so having rescued a couple of off-the-track thoroughbreds, I, I have a personal experience with this. And so we need to allow them to have forage all the time, which is something that the uh, industry doesn't generally do. There are exceptions, but generally not. And we need to avoid feeding them huge amounts of cereal grains because cereal grains increase the formation of acid, which already exacerbates the fact that they don't have enough forage and they already have ulcerations. So I think the industry needs to, to change. I think we need to have more respect for horses that are young and allow them to their their growth plates to close before we start getting on their back and racing them and i don't know if that's going to happen but i'm hoping hoping that it will yeah me too well thanks for that too i knew you i knew you'd care about the horse yes. and uh, you know we don't want to think that they're disposable and i know that there's a lot of people out there doing great things with ottbs off the track thoroughbreds um, mm -hmm. in repurposing them and giving them new lives and bless their hearts because i know they're probably having to go through some of those issues that you just spoke of in um, getting them back to health and getting them uh, getting their bodies and their minds sound again and but they're very um, athletic and uh, resourceful mm -hmm. oh yes that's a, yeah, a great breed. And I they, love thoroughbreds. Yeah. Oh, that's all I've ever had, really. <laughs> Those are the appendix. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, and I, and I hope that you know that the knee jerk. Um, I, I hope that the industry will pay attention to what people are saying this time, and mm -hmm. that the knee jerk won't be to just ban everything. Banning never seems to really help the horse. <laughs> it always right. seems to uh, eliminate that whole um, segment of horses, which which condemns a lot of horses to death, frankly. So I, I mean, yes. people think about that side of it too. You know, <clears throat> there's bad people in every breed and every discipline, every industry. Um, but I, I hope change will be the, the chant that people will put out there. Well, the horses that are um, uh, misused, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. would be those horses that age very quickly, mm -hmm. that become more disposable, so to speak. Yeah. And so the horses that live into their 30s that I described earlier, those are horses that are, are treated, treated more gently, that are allowed to have a good, fruitful life and not endure the intense damage to their bodies that, um, that some of the industries, or the performance industries will, will subject them to. Good. All right. I hope people are listening and listening and, and writing and doing their part. So uh, we came out with two two hashtags in this one. No soy, no gastrocard. <laughs> we got, we got a campaign going, but we learned a lot. Thanks so much again, Juliet Getty, for joining us at Getty Equine Nutrition. And, and your website is? My website is GettyEquineNutrition.com. Dot com. Easy enough. Give her a call. Yes. Write her and learn from her. Read read all the wonderful articles that you put out. I see you everywhere, Juliet. You you must not sleep. Well, I do sleep. I have to have my sleep. Oh, good. <laughs> we feel better. But, but uh, during the during my waking hours, I really am consumed with writing and you know making lives better for horses. Absolutely, that's nice, and that's why we love you. Thank you for being on Thank Horsemanship Radio. That. Take care. Thank you. Whisper. Of the Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, you work mostly on horse problems, such as biting, kicking, or refusing to go into the trailer. Do you think your methods could make top horses even more successful, get dressage horses more concentrated in the arena, or make show jumpers show more spirit in the course? Have you ever been successful in working with top sport dressage or show jumping horses? Monty's answer. When you create a partnership with your horse, causing the horse to do his work because he wants to and not because he is forced to, then you improve the performance of that horse no matter what the discipline is. I have worked with dressage horses for both Camilla Dupont and Charlotte Bridal. Charlotte, who was an Olympic bronze medal winner in Barcelona, uses my methods and has horses in training with me. 
At one time, my partner, Jeff Lovinger, and I owned wonderful thoroughbred who didn't make it to the racetrack, so we put him in a hunter-jumper program on my farm. Now deceased, Snapper became one of the world's best show jumpers for several years and was shown by Hap Hansen and Will Simpson in both the United States and Europe. Rough Frolic led the United States for several years as a hunter and was one of the most successful in that division. It happens that Rough Frolic retired early from racing and went out to be what is known as a strip hunter in the United States. These are judged on confirmation as well as performance. These are not the only two top competition jumpers that I worked with, but they are the most noteworthy. However, please do not think that any equestrian discipline is unique. Where horses are concerned, the similarities far outweigh the differences regardless of the breed, the size, or the activity. A horse is a horse and the needs of the, these animals are not limited to particular disciplines. I have ridden in eight world championships in the show ring. Well, all of these were in the Western Division. I also showed many hunters and jumpers and won one national championship in the saddle, which involved hunters, jumpers, and Western horses. I can state categorically that the general needs of the horses in each of these disciplines are quite similar. To achieve high performance from the cutting horse, reining horse, hunter, or jumper, certain elements of cooperation must be accomplished. It matters not what the discipline is. Probably the most important horses of the latter half of my career have been off of the racetrack of the world, and I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the same elements are important there as in the above-mentioned disciplines. I have been fortunate to work with over 400 international stakes winners in racing competition. I had a horse of the world two separate years. Those individuals needed the concepts I have discovered as much as any of my cutting horses or rain cow horses did. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, Go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum... And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. October 12th, he'll be at Hadlow College in the UK. Then October 18th, he goes to Hartbury College in Hartbury, UK. October 20, he'll be at the Myers Co. College in Billsboro. And then he trains privately over in England for a while. Then he goes to November 16th, he'll be in Poland. He'll be doing the Monty Roberts tour there for at least one evening. It's almost sold out, though, so I think we're going to be going to the November 17 as well. That's ahead news here. And then he'll be at Horse Sense and Healing in both Germany and then back home December 13 through 15. He'll be in another Horse Sense and Healing. And then he gets Christmas. That's it. And then he gets Christmas. That's it. <laughs> and if you did not commit all of that to memory, I know I didn't, you can find all of that and so much more at MontyRoberts.com or you can call the good folks at Flag is Up Farms at 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, that would be episode 144, you can go to horsemanshipradio.com where you will find links about today's guests and topics, photos, and more information. And we love your feedback. It helps Debbie find things to talk about on the show and find guests and stuff like that. So okay. if you've got ideas, we'd love to hear about them on the Facebook page, please. The Facebook page is Monty Roberts. Just go to Facebook, go to the little top there and type in Monty Roberts and go to the one that has the little blue check mark. That's the official Monty Roberts page. And join the fun. And you can also follow Monty on Twitter. That's right. He tweets. It's Monty underscore Roberts. And it is the same at Instagram. Monty underscore Roberts. And get the app if you haven't done so already. You probably already have. Most people listen through the app. They went. You went to your app store and you searched Horse Radio Network and you clicked on it and you downloaded it. And you chose which shows you wanted to listen to or you chose the all shows because you're a real diehard podcast listener. That's right. What we would like you to do, your friends who all have smartphones, whether they use them or not, may be a little bit less tech savvy than you are. So gently take their cell phone from them when things are quiet and peaceful 
and download the app for them and show them how to use it. Yeah. That's right. Horse training tips. That's what we give them. (laughs) That's right. And app tips. Many thanks to our sponsors, too. We couldn't be here without them. Omega Fields, Cavallo, Horse and Rider, and Monty Roberts University. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network, too, at www.horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, have many happy horse hours.